Morning. Morning. Uh, I hope, uh, indeed, I, I pray that the Word of God will uh, speak to all of us this morning uh, as we open it up together. Open up your Bibles once again uh, to Mark chapter 14 as we continue uh, to take a look at the events that fill the final hours of Jesus' uh, life before his death on the cross. Uh, the last two weeks, if you were here with us and you've been following along with uh, the narrative, uh, we were in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. And this morning we'll be taking a look at the, the sham trial that took place uh, for Jesus in verses uh, 53 uh, to 65. I would, I would say that when, when you see those words today, sham and trial, <laughs> we're familiar with that, right? Just the climate that we live in, the politics that we have been dealing with over the past uh, several years, we, we know what this uh, is about. Uh, we've been endured two separate impeachment uh, trials, if you want to call them that, for President Trump. Uh, we're continuing to be tormented by a sham hearing about what happened on January 6th, right? We continue to, to deal with all of this, uh, we know. So we're quite familiar with, with what a sham is. A sham is nothing more than theatrics to give appearance of legitimacy, right? It, it's, it's, just, it's, it's a pretense is what it is. Uh, we, we're familiar with this now. It's... It's something that is done deliberately under false pretenses, is what a sham is. I think about back in the, the frontier days, and uh, uh, some of the old western movies that you used to watch, you used to have this wagon come rolling into town, and uh, that he, would, uh, he would be selling this uh, magic elixir, right, this special elixir that was guaranteed to heal you know, all manners of uh, disease, uh, uh, hair loss, right, Cancer, whatever it is, and uh, and he'd always have a partner that would work with him. Right? He'd have a plant, somebody that'd be in the, the crowd, and maybe they'd come out with a, a crutch or a cane and couldn't hardly walk, and and he'd ask for a volunteer, and they'd volunteer, and they'd walk out, and they would take a take a a, a capful, a spoonful of his magic elixir, and all of a sudden, like lightning would hit them, and like you know, they would just let go of that cane, and they would just do a jig and dance, and it's a miracle. And you're not being healed, but you see that's all a sham. Right. It, it, was a, it was a con, right? And of course the people wouldn't find out till later after they all bought their jar of his magic elixir and, and it made them sick probably instead of making them better and, and given this con man their money and done left town, it was all too late. The, the, the sham was finished, right? They've all been conned out of their money. And so now to be clear, Jesus wasn't conned by anyone. Right? Jesus wasn't conned by anyone, but everything about the trial he endured in the early morning hours of Good Friday was a complete and total sham. In the garden, Judas was, uh, was, was there, and, and Judas, in fact, revealed that his faith in Jesus was nothing but a sham, right? It was nothing but a sham. It was, it was, a, it was a pretense. He conspired with the chief priests and the elders and the scribes to betray Jesus. That Jesus had been arrested and taken into custody by the temple police and by the Roman soldiers without being charged or accused of any wrongdoing, right? That's problematic, <laughs> right? To, to be, to be uh, uh, detained, to, to be arrested and be in, uh, uh, held in custody without charges, you know, that's, that's wrong. And, and anywhere, uh, anywhere you go, uh, any way you look at it, all of his disciples had abandoned him to face a sham counsel that will drum up some sham charges so they could come up with a sham conclusion that will ultimately condemn Jesus to die on the cross. And that's what we'll pick back up in our passage this morning. So if you're there, in Mark 14 and verse 53 is where we'll pick up this morning. So if you have your Bible with you, let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word. Mark 14 verses 53 to 65. Beginning in verse 53, it says, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against, it, against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, 
I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent, answering nothing. Again the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, Prophesy! And the officer struck him with the palm the palms of their hands. This is God's word. Father in heaven, we, we come before you this morning and we ask that you would teach us your word. Father, as we look at the, the sham trial of Jesus and we look at how he was treated by the, the chief priest and the, the elders and the scribes, Father, let us not only look upon them and, and how they treated Jesus, but how do we treat Jesus today? How often do we put Jesus on trial in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Every decision that we make is a time for us to put Jesus on trial. Is Jesus Lord of all of our decisions? So, Father, I pray that as we look at this text and as we look at what was happening to Jesus in this moment, Father, help us examine our own hearts where we place Jesus on trial in our own lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Father, teach us your word. Let us leave here not only more informed of your word, but let us be transformed by your word. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I think it's always helpful for us to keep in mind as we study disturbing passages like this one. And this passage is disturbing. It should be disturbing to you, uh, just like it was disturbing to me. But it's important that we keep in mind that everything that happened to Jesus was a fulfillment of Scripture. Right? right. right? And, and so, so what do I mean by that? When, when I say that, I'm saying that everything that happened to Jesus had to happen to Jesus. Right? It, it had to happen to Jesus to fulfill God's eternal plan of salvation for sinners like you and like me. Everything that Jesus suffered through had to happen. Everything he suffered through to make our salvation possible was predicted by the prophets of God hundreds of years before it ever came to pass, right? Hundreds of years before he was even born. See, this passage, I believe, is just another example of Isaiah 53 being fulfilled, right? Isaiah 53 being fulfilled. Isaiah 53 says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Jesus was definitely despised and rejected, was he not? Mm -hmm. He was despised and rejected by the religious leaders, specifically the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. We see that in the text. Jesus was definitely becoming a man of sorrows, and he was certainly becoming very well acquainted with grief. You say, well, what grief? I would say the grief of the betrayal of Judas. Even though he knew he would betray him, it still had to cause him to experience grief, grief over the abandonment of all of his disciples. That was real. And of course, the greatest source of his grief was the forsakenness that awaited him as he hung on that cross when his father turned his back on him because he bore our sins. All these things grieved him. The grief of that forsakenness was now just hours away, and Jesus knew it. As a reminder, it's after midnight, right? To set the context as we look at this passage, it's dark. It's possibly somewhere between 2 or 3 a.m. on the morning of Good Friday. And again, as I like to often remind us, we call it Good Friday because it was good for us, but it wasn't good for Jesus. That's right. It was anything but good for him. It's in the middle of the night and the sham trial of Jesus is about to begin. The first thing that we see in our text is the sham council. The sham council. This is in verses 53 and 54. In verse 53, Mark shows us a corrupt assembly. A corrupt assembly. 
And when they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Now, as I mentioned last week, it's helpful to, if you're able to, to take the time and read the parallel accounts. Right, all four of the Gospels record this, and it's and it's, it's helpful for us to, to get a full picture of what was happening, because Mark's only pointing out what what was uh, 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 shared with him by Peter or what the Spirit inspired him to write down, but it's helpful to, to look at all this to get the complete picture of what was happening. Uh, each one of the Gospel writers seemed to have a slightly different emphasis, right? If you read them, you'll see that. Uh, or they'll have a different perspective on the events of that night that Jesus was arrested. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are all pretty similar. You can read them, and they're almost exactly the same, almost word for word the same. But John's Gospel is, a, is quite a bit different. Right, and I believe that that may be its difference because it was written so much later. It's a it's a it's a later uh, date of its writing. So we're not sure why. Uh, we just have to believe, as our discipleship lesson teaches us, that God inspired His Word, all of it. That's right. And so it, it has what it has because God inspired to have that, right? And so we believe that. Uh, for example, in John eighteen thirteen, we're told that they took Jesus to the home of Annas, the former high priest, first. Uh, he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the current high priest. And so that's that's a, a, a different uh, 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 from what our text shows. Uh, either way, uh, this was a no-no, right? This, this wasn't how things were supposed to be done. Uh, issues like this were to be handled according to, the, to God's word, according to the law of God's word. That, that God had made provisions for all these things, how these things were to be handled. Uh, in fact, pretty much everything about what transpired on that night was a violation of how things were to be done according to God's word. Right? Everything was a violation. Jesus was arrested without a charge, right? That's a violation. The, the, the council or the Sanhedrin wasn't permitted to consider a case dealing with a capital offense on a feast day, and yet they convened during the Passover, right? A <laughs> big no-no, right? They, that shouldn't have happened. The, the Sanhedrin wasn't permitted to render final judgments at night or outside of the sacred chamber of the temple, and yet here they are at the courtyard at Caiaphas' house, right? So they, they violated both of those in this instance. And there will be several other violations that I'll point out as we work through the text. And so who was this uh, corrupt assembly? Who was part of this corrupt assembly? It's the same group of individuals that have been after Jesus for, for years, right? Ever since he began his public ministry, these same individuals have been after him. We learn from John's Gospel that Caiaphas was the high priest at that time. The high priest was the most powerful and most influential man in Jerusalem, right? In Judaism, had lot, lots of power, lots of authority. The chief priests, the elders, and the scribes would have been part of the, this ruling council that made up the Sanhedrin. Many of them hated Jesus just as much as the high priest did. So this was already a, 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 a the deck was stacked against Jesus from the start. He had, he had no one on this council that was pulling for him. Right? They were all after him. They hated Jesus because he had exposed them as the power-hungry hypocrites that they were, disrupting everything at the temple during Passover week. You see, they weren't interested in justice. That's not what was happening here. They were only interested in vengeance. Vengeance is all they were interested in. This was a corrupt assembly indeed. Then in verse 54, Mark shows us a, a cowardly apostle. A cowardly apostle in verse 54. But Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. When they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, Peter was the only one to fight back. We remember that. We kind of give him kudos. Right? The rest of them didn't do anything. And he drew out his little sword and, 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 and swung at the... Uh, 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 Malchus and, and Pilate went for his head and his throat, but he just chopped his ear off. And so we look at that and we say, well, that was that was kind of bold. That was kind of brave. But now here we are uh, just a few verses later and, 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 and Peter fled with everyone else. When they all forsook Jesus, the rest of them went. He got to, get, uh, got to scooting with the rest of them. Uh, we're not told what happened with everyone else except for John. Uh, because of his gospel tells that he followed Jesus too. Right? Again, in John's gospel, he followed. It wasn't just Peter, it was also John, that he followed uh, Jesus as well, and that Caiaphas knew who he was. And so 
I think about John, John was even more bold in this because he wasn't he didn't have to hide who he was because the high priest already knew who he was and he still came anyway. Uh, John's account also includes Peter's first denial. And, uh, we'll look at that. John 18, verses 15 to 18. It says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Of course, we know that's John. Now, now that disciple was not known, that disciple was known to the high priest, and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door, and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of the man, this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers who had made a fire of coals stood there, for it was cold. And they, and, they, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. I, say, I think John demonstrated some boldness here. He demonstrated some boldness while Peter was typically the bold one of the group. Right? He's the one that, that always stepped out. We think of you know, who's the bold disciple? We think of Peter. We don't think of John. But here it is. John's kind of stepping up. Right? That, that now Peter's acting cowardly. And he's following Jesus, the text says, at a distance. At a distance. Peter wanted to stay close to Jesus, but not so close that it would cost him. Right? He wanted to stay close, but not, not so close that it would cost him. He, he wanted to stay close to Jesus, but not so close that it would make him too uncomfortable. You see, the text tells he sat and warmed himself by the fire. How many of us are following Jesus like this? Right? How many of us are following Jesus like this? We mainly follow Jesus in a, in a superficial manner, not enough to cost us anything really. We're fine with following Jesus as long as it doesn't make us too uncomfortable. Amen? Mm -hmm. As long as it doesn't make us too uncomfortable, we'll follow Jesus. We want a type of Christianity that is marked by comfort and convenience. Now let me let you in on a little secret. There's no such thing as a comfortable or convenient Christianity in the Bible. Right. It's not there. That's some made up thing. It's something that we've come up with here in the West. The, the following Jesus like we follow Jesus here, it's not in the Bible. We don't see it nowhere in Scripture. There's nothing comfortable or convenient about denying yourself. There's nothing comfortable or convenient about taking up your cross daily. There's nothing comfortable or convenient about following Jesus at all. Jesus made that abundantly clear. In Luke 9, 23 to 26, this is how Jesus gives an invitation. Right? We, we, churches nowadays don't do it this way, but this is his way. Starting in verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. A comfortable and convenient form of Christianity is a cowardly form of Christianity. It's a cowardly form of Christianity, and it's definitely not a biblical Christianity. You see, things were already inconvenient and uncomfortable for Jesus it was about to get much, much worse as things moved forward. As this sham trial moved forward, Peter could see what was happening to Jesus. And guess what? He didn't want any part of it. He didn't want any part of it. Peter was fine with being close to Jesus, but not too close to cost him anything. Could the same thing be said about some of us today? Could the same thing be said about, about us today? The second thing that we see in our text is the sham charges of this sham trial. In verses 55 through 61, the council was seeking sham charges to use against Jesus. Verses 55 and 56 says, Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. 
to this sham council, Jesus was guilty already. Right? He was guilty already. And all they needed now was to find the kind of testimony they needed to, to put him to death. And so they were trying to make this thing look legitimate, wasn't it? They were, they were trying to, to bring the pieces together to, to, to condemn Jesus. Sure, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes offered bribes to sketchy people like they did with Judas. All right, same thing. Again, it's the middle of the night. Where are they going to just find somebody? Right, people are sleeping. These, these, these people were, were props. They were already bought and paid for. They were waiting in the wings to be called in to give testimony. That's what was happening here. They bribed Judas to betray Jesus, and now they were bribing sketchy people to bear false witness against Judas, against Jesus. But they couldn't get their stories to match. Right? You, you know what that's like sometimes, and maybe you've been part of it, maybe it wasn't a malicious thing, but you're, you're trying to, something happened, and, and you know that maybe you was a child. Let's do that. Let's just go back to something when you were a child, and you were innocent, and you did something, you and your brother or you and your sister did something, and you broke something of, of mom or dad's, and, and, and they're at work, right? You know, we grew up latchkey kids. We didn't have babysitters, stuff like that, so we just, you know, we were left alone, and, and things happened. Sometimes bad things happen. And before mom and dad gets home, you know what we need to do? We need to get our story straight. We need to get our story straight. So when they come in and they found out that this, this vase is broke, that, that we both need to tell them that the, the, the dog did it. Right? We don't need to tell them that we were throwing the football in the house. Right? And so that's kind of what was happening here. They were trying to, you know, they, they, they bring in these people and they probably told them what to say. And even then, they couldn't get their stories to match up. They couldn't get their testimonies to match. So this wasn't working. This whole proceeding was a sham, and yet they were trying to give it some resemblance of being a legitimate trial, and the council needed credible witnesses with corroborating testimonies. All they needed was two, right? That's the standard, right? Where, where you know, two witnesses, if you have more than that, at least two must be uh, given to establish a credible witness. That's all they needed. They couldn't get that. This was, a, this was a, a, a complete train wreck. Pastor John MacArthur made this observation about uh, these verses. He said this, he said, Because Jesus was innocent, the Jewish leaders could not convict him except by relying on perjured testimony and perverted justice. The Jewish leaders were intent on doing whatever was necessary, even if they had to violate every biblical and rabbinical rule. See, this sham council was willing to violate the ninth commandment, right? To be able to charge Jesus with, with blasphemy, right? Commandment number nine, Exodus 20, 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And that's exactly what they were doing. And they knew they were doing this. False witnesses were saying false things about Jesus. Verses 57 to 59. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple and made with hands, and with, within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. The ones that the council had bribed would, couldn't get their story straight, so some of the council members themselves began to stand up and, and share and, and try to bear false witness against Jesus. Jesus had called them in the past a den of vipers, right? You scribes and Pharisees, you den of vipers, and now we, now we have a better understanding of why he called them that, right? They were deceptive, they were destructive, and, and ultimately they were deadly, just like a den of vipers. That's exactly what they were doing here. Apparently some of them were present when Jesus cleansed the temple the first time in the beginning of his public ministry. And they questioned his authority then to, to show us a sign. Show us how you have this authority to, to, validate, to validate your claim. Show us a sign. In John 2, uh, John 2, 19 to 22, we see this. Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. 
see this council member and their witnesses, they, they misunderstood what Jesus had said. They didn't understand what he was talking about, and their own stories didn't match up either. Becoming frustrated, the high priest himself began to question Jesus. Verses 60 and 61. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify about you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus once again remained silent. Remained silent, refusing to give this sham trial any hidden legitimacy. He's, I, he's thinking to himself, I have no reason. I have no reason to respond to any of these accusations, these charges. This, all of this is a sham. Jesus knew that. He had no reason to answer. He wasn't under any obligation to answer. But the high priest wasn't really wanting an answer from Jesus. He wanted a confession. Right? Now, I, again, I, I can't help but think of you know these 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 uh, movies about uh, law enforcement or cops. You know the, the bad cop, good cop, bad cop, and you got the perp in the in the uh, in the room, and you come in there and, you, and you're, you're sweating them out and all these things, and you're you're trying to coerce a confession. You're trying to trip them up and you're trying to twist them around and you're doing all these things. And I think that's that's what I see when I think about Caiaphas. I think about the high priest. He's trying to to coerce. He's trying to Fluster Jesus, trying to get him to say something to incriminate himself. That's what he's doing here. But nothing that Jesus could have said was going to change this council's verdict, was it? Nothing that he could say was going to change anything. Jesus' fate was sealed the moment he allowed himself to be arrested in the garden. In fact, Jesus' fate was sealed the moment he left heaven to be born of a virgin. This was going to happen. No matter what, nothing was going to stop this from happening. All this, as vile and disgusting as it was, had to happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled and so that we could be saved. This is another example of Isaiah 53 being fulfilled. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. For the high priest, he was done. No more messing around with false testimonies from false witnesses. The high priest and the council wanted a reason to put Jesus to death. And the charge of blasphemy would accomplish that. That's what they wanted to hear. That's what they needed to hear. So Caiaphas plainly and forcefully asked Jesus if he was the Christ, the son of the blessed. He is asking if he claimed to be God or equal with God. That's what was behind this question. Right? Are, are you claiming to be God or are you claiming to be the Son of God? Appreciate the insight of David McKenna on the ramifications of Jesus' response. He says, Caiaphas resorts to the tactic of leading the witness and forcing him either to condemn himself with the court or discredit himself with the people. That was his option, right? This was a no-win situation for Jesus. But that's not Jesus' concern. He's not, he's not trying to win here. He's not concerned with being discredited with the people. He's concerned with making eternal salvation possible for all people. That's all he's caring about right now. The only way that happens is if Jesus is condemned by the sham council and their sham charges. And the final thing that we see in our text is the sham conclusion of this sham trial. Verses 62 to 65. For Jesus finally broke his silence and confessed that he was, in fact, the Christ. Verse 62, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. I would like to encourage you to mark your Bibles. Because if you ever are ever out and about and you are witnessing, sharing the gospel, the good news, you may run into someone that uh, will tell you or ask you, where does... Where does it say in the Bible that Jesus is God? Now you know. Right, mark this verse. Verse 62. You have it. There have been many other occasions where Jesus revealed himself to people when he healed them, right? But what would he always do when he did that? He would tell them to be quiet. 
He would tell them to tell no one about this. Why would he do that? Because it, it wasn't yet time. Right? He, he, he didn't want, he didn't want to, to have the masses to come and the mobs to come. He didn't want them to do as they're even doing now. Uh, the people trying to force him to be the Messiah, right? He didn't want none of those things to happen. Told them to be quiet because it wasn't time. But guess what? Now is the time. Now was the time. No more need to keep his identity a secret anymore. Danny A. could put this, uh, Jesus' response this way. He says, the time for the Messianic secret has now come to an end. Call under divine oath to bear witness to his true identity. He does not flinch, nor does he waver. He directly and openly affirms, I am. In the Greek, that's ego, amen. Ego, amen. I am. Not only do the words I am confirm that Jesus was the Christ and the Son of the Blessed, I am also was the way that God declared himself to the Israelites through Moses. Do you remember that? When he goes, when he goes, he says, oh, they, they won't believe me. And he says, tell them I am sent you. Right? And so they would understand this. They would understand this. When Jesus said I am, this council, they knew their Bible. They knew their Old Testament. They knew exactly what he was saying. That wasn't clear enough. Jesus can uh, re refer uh, Daniel 7 by identifying himself as the Son of Man, right? A clear Messianic title. And if that still wasn't enough, he told them that they would see him sitting at the right hand of the power and that they would see him coming in the clouds of heaven when he returns to claim his bride and judge the world. In other words, they would see him again when he comes back to judge them. Jesus broke his silence and the high priest broke his clothes. Verse 63 and 64. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. When Jesus broke his silence, I have the picture in my mind of a room full of grumpy old men spitting out their drinks. Right? And they all just started they're just in shock of what had happened. They can't believe that, that he finally said it. You have this outburst and all of a sudden you have a moment of deafening silence. Ky Caiaphas couldn't believe it. He had to be shocked more than anyone. He, he's probably thinking, he thought it was going to be harder than this, but it wasn't. It, he gave him exactly what he needed. Jesus had finally given them what they needed to condemn him to death. This was blasphemy to them. But here's the thing about the charge of blasphemy. You see, Jesus could not be charged with blasphemy. Why? Because he is God. He is the Son of God. He, it's not possible for him to commit blasphemy. Nevertheless, this being a sham trial, facts don't really matter. Again, I keep referring to things that we've seen in recent years. Whenever the whole process is a sham Facts don't matter. Don't bring your facts here. Don't bring your truth here. We've already determined what we believe. We don't want to hear that. Caiaphas proceeds to take this sham trial to the next level and tears his clothes as a display of righteous indignation. I believe he's so offended or pretends to be so offended. He's really laying it on thick. I bet he would win a, an Academy Award for Best Dramatic Actor. Laying it on thick, tearing his clothes. He just, he can't believe what he just heard. He can barely stand to be in the same room with Jesus. They didn't need the false testimonies or the false witnesses anymore because they all had just heard it for themselves. They had all witnessed, it, witnessed firsthand Jesus' blasphemous words for themselves. Caiaphas called for a vote. And guess what the vote was? Unanimous. Unanimous. Jesus was guilty like they had always planned for him to be. You see, the, the verdict was never in doubt. Yeah. It was the process of getting there. He was already guilty according to them, and now they had exactly what they needed. They wanted him dead, and now he has done something, in their opinion, deserving of death. This was another violation of the council's principle calling for patience in cases where matters worthy of death. They didn't wait 24 hours as was required, right? They understand the process of, or God would know, that sometimes witnesses come forward and before we execute someone speedily, we need to make sure we have all the information. They didn't do that. 
They didn't care about the law. They just wanted Jesus dead. Right? They just wanted Jesus dead. And now they had their opportunity. Think about it. They arrested, arraigned, tried, convicted, and sentenced Jesus all within the matter of a couple of hours. Wow. It's amazing. How did that happen? Or why would this happen? Because it was a sham. It was a complete sham. Jesus broke his silence and some of them began to try and break him. Verse 65. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. To spit on someone was one of the highest forms of insult there was in that day, in that culture. I would just go on to say, I think it's probably one of the most insulting things that still happens today. Right? You, nobody <laughs> enjoys or appreciates having someone come up and spit in their face. Uh, again, I keep referring to recent history. And I think back to the, the, the riots and all that stuff like that, and the protesters and the Antifa and all of them would get up in the face of law enforcement. What were they doing? Spitting on them. Spitting straight in their face. And those officers showed amazing amounts of restraint. If that was me, again, I'm not a cop. I am a pastor. But I'm just being honest. If someone were to come and spit directly in my face, I'm not sure what I would do. <laughs> Mr. Lee says he'd pop them. I probably would too. Right? But again, it's the, that, that's why they were doing it because they were insulting them. They were disrespecting them in the greatest way. And that's what was happening here. They were spitting in Jesus' face. They were spitting on him. This is another example of their sham, righteous indignation. They knew that he was known by some to be a prophet. And so what did they do? They, they mocked him. They blindfolded him. They said, well, if you claim to be a prophet, and they, and they would whack him. Get, which one of us did that? Right? If you're such a mighty prophet of God, why don't you tell us who just, who just whacked you if you claim to be a prophet? They mocked him. And they began to beat him. And when the council was done beating him and belittling him, they turned him back over to the temple police and they went to work, striking Jesus with the palms of their hands. You see, the council took it easy on him compared to what they did. Right? They brutalized Jesus. You see, Jesus was right again. He knew this was going to happen. This is precisely what he said was going to happen back in Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34. He said, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. This was brutal, right? We're we, we not going to debate that. This was brutal. But the brutality of the Romans will be much, much worse, as we will see in the coming weeks. So this morning, as we close our time together, as we think about all that Jesus endured, the injustices, the mocking, the insults, and the physical brutality. Let us not lose sight of why this was happening to him. Right? Why? The why behind this. It wasn't happening to him because he deserved to be condemned. Right. It was happening to him because we deserved to be condemned. This wasn't about Jesus. This is about us. What we deserve. Everything that happened to Jesus happened to accomplish God's eternal plan of salvation for you and for me. For the whole world, as a matter of fact. Jesus took the guilt of our sins upon himself so that we could take upon ourselves his righteousness. That we could become righteous once again through repentance and faith in him. That's God's eternal plan of salvation. That's the only way it's possible. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So let me just ask you this morning, have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus yet? Have you become the righteousness of God in Jesus yet? Right? That's, that's important. Everything I've shared this morning is, is critical and it's important. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that, but, but your, how you answer those two questions are vitally important for you as an individual. 
what Jesus did for you and me on the cross was God's gift to us. Do you know that? It was a gift, but you see, like any other gift, it doesn't really belong to us until we take possession of it. Think back of around Christmas time, I've heard that I don't know, untold millions of dollars uh, remain uh, uh, on gift cards. People buy gift cards for Christmas and, and, and they send them out, but they never get used. Right? They never take possession of those, those gifts. They never uh, benefit from those gift cards. It's the same way with salvation. same way with uh, uh, reconciliation with, with God through Christ. Until we take possession of it for ourselves, it doesn't really matter. It just remains there. It's like a gift sitting alone on the table. You've never taken possession of it. My question for you this morning is, would you receive God's gift of eternal life? Would you do that? Would you submit and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning? So that's, that's what I'm asking for you this morning. If you have not placed your faith in Jesus, that's what you need to do today. If, if God is stirring your heart, if the Spirit of God is making you feel anxious, you may be hungry, but that's not hunger pains. That's the Spirit of God stirring up something inside you, convicting you of your sin, saying, hey, you need to get saved. You need to repent. You need to place your faith in Jesus today. If God's doing that for you this morning, don't leave here without doing business with Him. Church, this is a reminder, all this that we have saw this morning, that this wasn't because of Jesus, this is because of us. Everything that he went through was for us, for our benefit. He was condemned in our place so that we would have to be condemned before God. Praise God for Jesus. Amen. Praise God for his amazing grace. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. Father in heaven, we, we come humbly before you this morning as we conclude looking at your word this morning and as we're reminded of this sham trial that, that Jesus endured. The way he was mocked, the way he was belittled, the way he was spit upon, with the way he was beaten, the way he suffered, all, all these things were done for us. All these things were done for, because this was the plan that, that you came up with in eternity past. This is the one and only plan of Salvation, the one and only plan of redemption, that your sinless son had to suffer and die to atone for our sins. So, Father, I thank you for Jesus' obedience. Father, as, as hard as it is for me to read these texts and see him suffer this way, to see his disciples turn their back on him and, and, and walk away from him and abandon him in his time of need, to see Judas betray him the way that he did to see this council question him and place him on trial father i'm reminded i think that we're all reminded this morning is that that we do some of the same things that we're guilty of the same things in various ways so god this morning we come before you asking you to forgive us where we've sinned against you we ask that you would forgive us where we have place Jesus on trial in our own lives. Father, help us to live in obedience. Help us to submit ourselves. Help us to not, not want to have a type of Christianity that's not in the Bible. Help us to not always seek to find the, the, the comfortable way to follow Jesus, the, the safe way to follow Jesus. Father, I pray for those who are here this morning that have not yet placed their faith in Jesus. God, I pray that you would stir their hearts up. We know that, that no one can be saved unless you draw them to yourself. And so, Father, I'm asking that you do some drawing this morning. That you would save in this place. That you would be glorified. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.